Well, life is slowly getting back into a shape in the UK. The COVID vaccination program has gone well. G7 is being held in London. Joining us in the studio for the first time in a long time, CEO of the British Chamber of Commerce, David McCready. Good morning, David. Nice to see you face to face. Morning. It's great to be here. How are you, Dave? Now, look, we've just heard all this and a lot of people watching this program will think, oh, fantastic, we'll get mum and dad out from England, but it's not going to be that easy. No, it's not. And the problem is at this end with our hotel quarantine and with restrictions on bringing people into the country at the moment, we're really focused on repatriating Australians rather than uh, bringing people from other countries in. So uh, tourists are still going to be uh, a long way away, I'm afraid. Mm. And uh, some interesting news today. The economy will grow this year at the fastest pace since the Second World War. So would that be a combination of the vaccine rollout and also the lifted restrictions? Yeah, I think the other thing to to really keep in mind here is that the UK suffered a really bad economic downturn about a year ago and uh, obviously with the lockdown, particularly the lockdown over the last few months that's uh, obviously on the way out at the moment, um, they've really struggled to really get going again whereas we here in Australia as we know have seen much more of a V-shaped recovery. The UK has sort of dawdled along a little bit in their recovery. Uh, so the next uh, period in the next six months or so as the economy opens up, as people get back to work, uh, absolutely we'll see a really big pick up and, and that will not uh, give us quite the uh, recovery we've seen here in Australia, but it will help going to uh, offset the big drop that they had last year. It's been quite a uh, few weeks for the Australia-UK relationship. Of course, Foreign Minister Maurice Payne visiting London for the, the G7 Foreign Minister's meeting. Yeah, she did. And it was terrific to see a, a sense of normality. I, I know that the Indian uh, foreign minister wasn't able, unfortunately, to join the meetings in person after a, a positive COVID test in his uh, entourage. But uh, it's terrific to really see uh, diplomacy getting back to that uh, normal uh, state of having people seeing each other face to face. And Minister Payne also met with Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab. Yeah, absolutely. And, and these are important meetings. We've, um, we've generally had a bilateral meeting every year, uh, what we call AUKMIN, the 2 plus 2, the Defence and, and Foreign Ministers with the, the secretaries, respective secretaries in the UK. And that hasn't happened uh, last year, uh, hasn't happened this year yet. Uh, there's hope that there'll be a, a formal meeting uh, of those later in the year. But it's terrific to, uh, to use the opportunity to, to see each other face to face and to talk about a lot of the issues that have been going al along in the world. I mean, geopolitics has been uh, quite an interesting space in the last 12 months or so, particularly in our region. Uh, so it's good to be able to talk to our UK friends about what we see and, and how we can work together. There's always a few surprises that are thrown up at uh, these types of meetings. Was there any at the G7 foreign ministers meeting? Not really, to be honest. I think we're, we're pretty co comfortable with many of the outcomes. I mean, the, the sorts of things that you'd expect. There's uh, some rhetoric about Russia, the Ukraine, uh, what's happening in China and uh, in terms of human rights in, in particular, and also reinforcing the rules-based system, the international rules-based system that allows us to trade with confidence with other countries and, and really seeing China, uh, asking China to step up on that. But also, obviously, the, the biggest issue at the moment globally is, is COVID, uh, first and foremost, but also a lot of talk about climate change with, obviously, uh, a couple of things still to go this year in terms of the UK's uh, leadership. Firstly, the G7 leaders meeting in June, which uh, we expect Scott Morrison to travel to the UK for. And then, of course, COP26 at the end of the year and really looking to push forward that climate change agenda that's really been gathering a lot of momentum this year. Yeah, it really is a precursor of what we're seeing now, isn't it, to the, to the June uh, uh, catch-up as well, where President Joe Biden will be attending, as you mentioned, Scott Morrison too. So we're plenty on the agenda there. Yeah, absolutely. And, and look, a, a lot of that's sort of been framed up, I guess, by this uh, foreign minister's meeting, which is exactly what it's there for. But uh, I'm sure that Australia will be coming under increasing pressure to make a commitment uh, towards COP26. We know that Joe Biden in particular has, has really changed that narrative from the Americans' point of view. And, uh, and, and Boris Johnson has done a really great job in terms of leading the world during uh, the UK and, and Italian presidency of, of COP26 this year. Uh, well, it's actually been over two years because it was meant to be la at the end of last year. Uh, but uh, really done a great job in, in showing that leadership and, and a lot of public policy settings at home in the UK uh, leading to better outcomes on climate change and hoping that uh, countries like Australia might come on board. It is nice to see people again with this foreign diplomacy, as you're saying, a little bit more of the normalcy. Uh, 
in a pretty abnormal world. But Dan Tian was there a few weeks ago himself. Yeah, that's right. He was there at the uh, back end of the week of what was 22nd and 23rd of April. Really important for the Australia-UK relationship. We're negotiating a free trade agreement. Uh, it's been going quite well, but the, the impact of having ministers meet and, and cut through some of the, the challenges that negotiators don't necessarily uh, want to give up early in conversations uh, really helped move the conversation forward. They've entered a five-week sprint to try and have an agreement in principle due, uh, done by the time the G7 meters, uh, meetings are on in, in June. Uh, that won't be the end of the negotiations, but it'll hopefully give... A, pretty clear indication of where most of the outcomes will be. There'll still be some negotiations needing to do after that. And then there's obviously the, the, the finalisation of text, eventual signing, probably around uh, November time and, and hopefully coming into force early next year. What can you tell us about the, uh, the G7 foreign ministers uh, calling on China to respect human rights following the summit? Uh, look, human rights isn't normally a huge part of the Australian-British Chamber of Commerce's uh, uh, context, but I think it's been something that uh, the G7 leaders have spoken about over a number of years. Uh, clearly, it's an issue that continues to go on, and, and the UK is really um, partly uh, responding because of the G7 leadership, but also their role in the UN at the moment. They have a, a really strong say uh, about how the rest of the world should be uh, putting pressure on China to make sure that those human rights are upheld. So I think it's the right, right thing to do, that we continue to put pressure on, organ uh, on countries that aren't, aren't living up to the rules that they've signed up to. Not part of your brief, but you answered it very well. Now, what about Brexit? We haven't heard of Brexit, like, because everything else has flooded it away. Well, how's, it all, how's it all going? How's the... Uh, you know, because it it's happening in the background. Well, that's right. I mean, Brexit formally happened, obviously, at the beginning of last year and, and the, the, the changeover at, at the beginning of this year in terms of the end of the transition period and, and into the new uh, trade and cooperation agreement between the UK and the EU. Um, look, some of that has actually been a bit masked by the fact that, uh, that you know, we're not able to travel as freely as we can uh, normally in terms of not us Personally, we're still stuck here in Australia, but in between the UK and, and Europe, where normally lots of people travel daily between places like France and, and, and the UK. Um, initially, there was a massive um, hold and pause, I guess, in trade. People were very worried about what the implications were going to be of you know, new paperwork that they had to fill in and, and some of the adjustments that have needed to be made. And there's a lot of things that haven't actually been resolved in terms of the EU-UK relationship. There's still work being done on financial services, on automotive parts and a whole range of other things. So some of How's those... fishing going? Uh, well, fishing was quite interesting. You're obviously alluding to the, uh, the French fleet uh, arriving in Jersey, which obviously is far closer to France than it is to the UK. Mm. Um, look, I think there's going to be uh, tension at, at various times in industries where people feel they have a right. Um, the French fishermen do actually, if they can show traditionally they fished in those waters, they can get a licence and can fish. So I think some of it's probably around explaining to people exactly what the new regulations and reforms mean so that they can engage with it more effectively. Mm. Always great to chat to you. Nice to see you and uh, hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thanks for Are we any chance of getting some Ashes fans out here, you reckon? Oh, we've all got our fingers crossed, of course, as sports fans. It's a huge year with the Ashes coming. Um, look, the green zone's a positive step, but obviously with all the restrictions back here, time's ticking. Yeah, look, I think the, the big key to any uh, opening or loosening of the Australian border is how comfortable we are with COVID being in our community. And, you know, we've seen just this week uh, a man who clearly likes barbecues, um, uh, you know, contracting it in, in Sydney and, and worried about how that unfolds. Whilst we don't have a high level of vaccination and herd immunity, that's going to be a challenge. And we have to figure out at what point do we, uh, to, do we make that switch in, in narrative around uh, not wanting to have any COVID in the community, but then getting to a point where we've got enough people vaccinated, we're comfortable with the idea that some people will get it, but it will be a more mild mm. Um, mm. version, which is what the vaccines uh, broadly have, have enabled. Um, so at that point, we'll obviously be able to uh, take those steps to, to welcome people in. But I think uh, by the end of the year, we've, it'll be touch and go if we get there. 
I think it's probably more likely next year, unfortunately. They've got enough expats here anyway to fill in the Barmy Army. I, uh, good to see you, and uh, we'll catch up with you soon. And, and that's good, having spoken to people back in the UK, to see life starting to mm. normalise. It's been a difficult, difficult time. Pub beer gardens are very full. Oh, yeah. I can imagine, yeah. I'm looking Absolutely. forward to that, hopefully. Mm. Getting into summer too. Sooner rather than later.